actually just that. this whole forgiveness thing real? I know I need to be here. This is good. I have things in my life that I need to get off my chest. God already knows what I did. It's not like he'd be shocked. I can't remember the last time I've done this. I don't even remember what to say. What if the priest remembers me? What if someone I know sees me? They'll know I did something wrong. This seat is really uncomfortable. Is this whole forgiveness thing real? Can't I just tell God on my own? If I'm in there too long, people might think I did something really bad or that I have a lot of sins. Come on, man, just go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Father, I have to be honest. I have no idea how any of this works. I haven't been to confession since I was 10. I'm a little nervous. Well, first of all, I'm glad that you're here. You've made a good decision. And you've come to ask our Lord for forgiveness. That shows a lot of courage. Thank you. Now, before we begin, let me ask you a question. Do you really want to be here? Is this something that you're doing for you? Or did someone force you to come today? I made the decision to come. I know that I need to be here. There are things from my past that, that I need forgiveness from. Good. Now, there's one thing to remember about the sacrament of confession, that it's Christ himself who's going to forgive your sins. So I'm just the instrument that he uses. I can't forgive sins on my own, but rather Christ uses me as the instrument to forgive your sins. So as we move forward, remember that. You're speaking directly to Christ. Okay. So let's begin again in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now you can begin. Uh, what's heavy on your heart? What would you like to bring to our Lord? Well, I feel like a lot of times I'm, I'm too sad. Is there anything else you'd like to bring to our Lord's mercy? No, uh, just that. Okay. Well, again, it's a great thing that you're here. Uh, for your penance, I would just like you to say one Our Father and one Hail Mary, just as an act of thanks to God for his mercy. Do you think you could do that? Yeah. Okay. And if you could please just make an act of contrition, there should be a sheet for you to read off of. You just read that out loud, and then afterwards, we'll finish with absolution. My God, I am sorry for having offended you. In choosing to do wrong and failing to do good, I have sinned against you whom I should love above all things. I firmly intend with your help to do penance, to sin no more and to avoid whatever leads me to sin. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, suffered and died for us. In his name, my God, have mercy. Amen. Amen. God, the Father of mercy, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us, for the forgiveness of sins. To the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace. And I absolve you from your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Again, it's a great thing that you came today. And I hope you never forget that your sin, no matter how great or how small, uh, God's mercy is greater. We just have to come and ask him for it. Thank you, Father. I'll remember that. Okay. God bless you. See you next time. God, 
thank you for leading me here to confession. Although I don't totally understand it, I know that it is you who forgives. Thank you for your mercy and love. Help me not sin and turn away from you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Okay, good afternoon. Well, it's a couple of uh, uh, quite powerful uh, images we saw. One was a video, first one was a skit. Now, um, just a question for the class. Uh, going back to that skit that we just uh, witnessed earlier, there was this line which uh, I don't seem to get. Um, Jesus actually said um, something like, uh, your sins are forgiven? That's what he said, right? And those were supposed to be his healing words. Can someone explain to me? You have any idea why? What does uh, sin have to do with the fact that this, uh, this uh, patient was a paralytic? Uh, don't you, did anybody of you find that a bit strange? Huh? Anybody? Uh huh. It's not strange. Why? Why? Why isn't it strange? Uh, by Jesus telling him that your uh, sins are forgiven, he's healing his soul. He is uh, letting him know that he is loved by God, that he is accepted by God, and uh, anything physical doesn't really matter. What's, what matters is a crippled soul looking for salvation. So. So basically, he was brought there because he was paralyzed, and Jesus healed his soul. The, it was the soul that was paralyzed? Now I'm getting confused here. Uh, it was both. Okay. Uh, but how do you make that? There seems to be a, a chasm, a disjoint somewhere, like the physical with the spiritual here. Anybody has an idea in this class? Because that's what we're talking about actually today. It's about the sacraments of healing. Okay? But there seems to be a mystery here, uh, you know, some sort of a leap somewhere. But we do have to make the connection. Anybody? I believe when we sin, we create a distance between ourselves and God. To that extent, our souls are paralyzed. I mean, it, uh, it, he it keeps us from going ahead and being one with God. Maybe we are shy of what we've done. We are ashamed, probably. I, I think that basically echoes what was also mentioned here about the healing of the soul, right? But still, that leaves us with the question, what about the physical paralysis? I, I have a question as to then, when someone is born like that, what sin have they committed that they're born paralytic? <laughs> if they're born with a paralysis, huh? how's that? Okay, <laughs> okay yes, ma'am. You want to say something? It was the Jewish belief that anybody who has any uh, uh, this, uh, disabled yes. uh, is the reason because they were punished by God for their sins. This is what the Jewish belief have people take, undertake, yes. I think, I think we stumbled actually on the answer here. It's something that is cultural during that time, huh? that when somebody is actually suffering from some form of ailment, that the reason for this is because of some sort of an offense, a sin against God, and you're being punished for it, which makes it even more interesting what you mentioned. What if he was born that way? So whose sin is it? Uh, the parents. God forbid, the grandfather or the grandmother. <laughs> No, but then there is another part in the, in the gospel, which I don't remember, where Jesus says that it's not because of his sins or the sins of his ancestors, but then there's something else related to that, right? I think that, was, that was the beauty, actually, of that particular scene, when Jesus himself, with authority, now, God himself speaking to you, saying, your notions have been wrong all the, all, all the time, see? It's not because of your uh, 
parents are godparents. Yes. I also think Jesus um, wanted to show or demonstrate that through, you know, under authority from God, he had, he had the power to forgive sins. And if he said your, your sins are forgiven, nobody can observe that. Okay, you can't, okay, where's the proof? But by saying your sins are forgiven, rise up. So the physical was, you know, the physical healing was visible. Okay, so people could see that Jesus had power to physically heal somebody. And if he has power to do that, then why can he not have power to, to forgive sin? So I think that also may be part of it. He wanted to show that through God's mercy, he can heal and forgive sins. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, to add on to the question he asked, uh, I think that Jesus himself was a suffering servant. So likewise, it doesn't mean that just because someone was inflicted with paralysis, that the person was a sinner. Because very often, um, the ones who really suffer basically are helping in the redemptive plan of God. So I think here Jesus was probably using this particular instance, this um, miracle to show his authority as Joe said, and also um, his miraculous power of healing. So he took that, uh, that cultural belief, you know, and he used that whole situation to precisely showcase his authority, his unquestionable authority, which is directly from God through him, him who was God as well. Uh, quite interesting. So this kicks off basically our discussion now about the sacrament of healing. Now, let's go fast forward 2,000 or so years after. Ado Domini, we're 2015 now, okay? And uh, you see this uh, adolescent boy going for confession. Now, the question is, okay, what exactly does confession do now? What does it do for you? You, as an adolescent 16-year-old, uh, this simulation, right? So everyone here is 16 years old. Wow. <laughs> what does it do for you? You know? Huh? Anybody? Let's, let, let's hear from the back. Someone else. Please. Please, please. Yeah? I, pardon? Okay. The forgiving love. Okay, okay. So, and that's the reason why, okay, we go to confession? Huh? To seek the friendship of God? Yes? Uh huh. Okay, okay. But, 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 okay, but now it's very clear what we said. When, when Jesus was here 2,000 years ago, he basically established this authority, right? And he showed us that I can forgive sins and I am, I am God, right? So nowadays, um, I don't know if it happens also in other countries, but uh, some hard-headed Filipino Catholics have this thing that... Uh, <laughs> You know, I could stay home and ask his forgiveness straight, you know. Jesus Christ, the, you know, the paralytic, he establishes authority. So I could pray straight to him and he forgives me. And I do a couple of rosaries and that's good enough. I went to confession. Ah, it's not a priest. Okay, which brings me to the next question. What do you need for a valid confession then? What are the things, the elements that you need for a confession to actually be, you know, effective. Now, let's start, let's say with, uh, let's start with yourself. Yeah? What would be required? Well, first of all, you have to know your sins and uh, uh, repent, regret, and then go to confession with an open heart. Otherwise, it's not you, no use. Three things were mentioned. 
you have to know your sins. You have to have that sense of regret. You wanted to add something, sir? Please. I think it's better. Can I share it? Uh, uh, situational. I think situational it was better because I tried to answer in because in, I look for the subject in data and said anything. But what comes uh, what comes inside my mind is situational. Okay. I will represent my four-year-old boy that uh, five, almost five years old, KG one that time. Are you and going to no, no. I, I will situational because uh, before going to Steve uh, uh, he's praying and I heard him praying. He said, Lord. Uh, tomorrow I will be a good boy so that I will not be uh, face the wall. And I'm a daddy, and my boy is praying after his usual prayer, our father, Hail Mary, glory be, and about the family. And he mentioned about this Lord, uh, tomorrow I will be a good boy so I will not face the wall. So I am a daddy, he said, Oh, what's that? And then after that, uh, following day, I meet the, 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 the teacher and say, uh, Shakira, this is my, uh, my, my son is uh, uh, in prayer. And then my, the teacher told me, I'm sorry, uh, sir, uh, I did not uh, did mention about your son is naughty. And then I said, it's okay for me. Uh, I used to make a quiet chair. And then, and from that on, it's a uh, it's, uh, big impact to me. What if my, I live, it's good, it's good idea that my son is praying direct, but what if as he grows on, he will not inform me. He will go on to Facebook and say, I am feel sad. And others will say, uh, it's better for you. And others say, oh, how sad. And then, you know the impact. If he will go to the peers or the, to the friends and not, not totally uh, enrich, uh, not with the good care with parents, priest, with confession. Is in, uh, I, I hope you understand. From I that on, good point the there, relationship, yeah, from that on, yeah. I, he used to tell me a, a little thing, Daddy, I'm like this and like this. We are oh. so close from that time. I, 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 think, I think that was a good analogy for something that you're driving at as another aspect of confession. No? Uh, we covered very important points already that you have to do some kind of a uh, self-reflection yeah, to find out really what your, your examination of conscience. Thank you very much. Yeah? And then, of course, the genuine sincerity of actually being remorseful and sorry for your sins, right? But when it comes now to some of the more formal aspects of it, like having to do it, okay, in front of a priest for the absolution, why? And the priest, as you were saying, right, you would rather that he came to you as his father, right? So now... Yes, ma'am. You want? Yeah, we Uh huh. Okay. Exactly. True. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So there's that that sense of humility as well. Okay. Okay. Uh yeah. Sir, you want to say something? I feel uh, when. Connecting to what Phil said, humility. When we sin, it is no, uh, not only do we sin against God, but we sin against somebody. Our sin will have some effect on somebody else in the uh, community. So when you go to the Father, He He represents the human as well as the divinity, Christ. So the humility is so the sin that I have done has affected somebody else. My neighbor has been affected. So to get the reconciliation, you reconcile with God. To reconcile with God, you'll have to reconcile with your fellow being. So uh, the father represents the fellow being at the uh, confessional box. And you and as well. So as uh, I think uh, we're moving toward, uh, okay, the fact if I don't want, I don't mean to preempt your thoughts, but I think what you've been trying to say also is that, of course, you need the priest there because you need the proper representative of Jesus Christ 2,000 years hence. And that's why this whole thing was established, right? And, uh, and that's the reason why we go to uh, basically the priest in a confession. Uh, Purvis? Okay. Well, 
if you see what happened actually, we did very little of teaching. And we have not taken about 12 minutes in this discussion. This is just a demo. But we engaged everyone in discussion. And all of a sudden, it wasn't a teaching anymore from the person standing in front of you, but it was a teaching that came from within each one. And each one had a valid answer. Yeah, Some may not be theologically the one that we wanted to arrive at, but we have a way to get there. Let me just take it one step forward. I'd like you to turn around to the person next to you and just think of one question. Do you think uh, Jesus heals people today? I want you to talk to your partner. And if you think so, have you seen something like that happen? I just talk to your partner. Just turn around and talk to someone. Do you think Jesus heals people today? And if so, yeah? No, you just discuss it. You know, if Okay, let's stop there. Uh, let's stop there. Is anyone willing to share something? Would somebody be willing to share what you discussed? Yeah. Um, the question was asked that whether we see healing in these days. Yes, we uh, personally, I have not seen uh, a healing of anybody, but I have seen people confessing that you know they have felt uh, healing. So that's yes, what we have discussed. Going to conversion, to being changed, but rather more than not just physical healing, but yeah, of conversion. Yeah. Uh, anybody else here? When we are live with Jesus, each and every single moment of our life, each and every single moment of our life, is we get healing. It not necessarily paralysis, uh, physical healing. Even our thoughts, you know, injuries, uh, in relationships, emotions, in every single thing, we get that healing. That's what our discussion. All right, that's interesting. Now, I'd like to ask you another question. What really was happening now? When I asked you the question, what really happened? You were interacting. You got involved. Uh, did you s sense a team building, a relation building? Yeah. What else happened? You communicated. What else happened? Yeah. yeah. You're See, she said, she acknowledged the person next to her. You said faith is past. Did you see leadership building? Yeah, because somebody moved up to speak. You saw opportunity to come up. So you could see, in a, in a single session, we have passed on faith. We have passed on doctrine. They have taught doctrine to each other. They have shared a discussion on the subject at their own levels. They have spoken about it, and now you have given your opinion. She has given her opinion. They have given their opinions. And all of us have given their opinion. The teaching was still only 10 minutes. And if, I mean, I mean you might say, yes, these are adult uh, answers. I'll tell you something. 
the answers that come out from the teenagers are far more tremendous than the ones we had here. And every live teen session literally shocks all of us as core team leaders. And really shocks some of our facilitators who help the group discussions. Because you suddenly begin to see the perspective a teenager is looking at life, which we don't understand, and what they really want out of life. Now, this is nothing. You have done nothing, really. As a facilitator, he has really done nothing. As a core team member, he's taken his hand out, just prepared himself, and tossed the questions to and fro. But what helped you was the first kit and the video. If you think of the video, what was the strong point of the video? What was, what, what was the video? What made the video so effective? You imagine? You think, you know, I get uh, my knees knocking when I have to go to confession. Yeah. But you see, yeah, you see an empty church. Frightening. The door, closed door. He is fear. And he goes there, he comes back. Confession suddenly becomes completely friendly. Something that can be done anytime. The friendship between the priest, the relationship between the priest and uh, the teenager, everything. So you see, all this adds up to the session. You saw one yesterday which, on the live teen uh, video. These are all part of the package that comes. And we really get a whole package for a whole semester. So we just are finishing a semester on the sacraments. And we just received our new package. It's on morality. Just in time for Lent, we're ready to launch into morality. We've got a teaching guide. We've got uh, music. We've got retreat planning guides. We've got training guides for teachers, training guides for facilitators, how you train each of the facilitators. All this comes to you from Life Team. And you've got access to their websites. And you can go back and look at, as I said, you know, years of material, which uh, then you can use whenever you want. So uh, it's not that you necessarily have to follow the program that's being offered to you. If you suddenly realize, OK, it's my parish feast, uh, I mean, it's a parish feast, and I'd like to do something different. So go and look for something, and you'll find something on the saints, perhaps. Uh, I'd quickly like to just show you. Uh, it's a PDF here of uh, if you just see this is a, a lesson sheet uh, that is handed out to all our core team and to our facilitators and uh, you can see there the sacraments of healing and life night the titles all very interesting rise and walk and they are catechism references, so you don't really have to do any research yourself. You can just go there and find out. Scripture, if you want, the key concepts. The goal of this night, about this night, what you need to inform parents about. The environment you've got to create. Every life team is a different environment. So you try and create that. So there's your plan. A gather for five minutes. The Healing of the Paralytic Skit, part one. We did both the parts together. Uh, and two. Then you have the proclamation, 10 minutes, on the sacraments of healing, penance, uh, reconciliation, confession. What does confession do? What is required? You see, we have, just, we have just gone through all of this very quickly. Uh, OK, I think that side's still OK. Uh, then you have uh, an additional one, the anointing of the sick, which we didn't really do today. What happens in the sacrament? And you can see all the links to the CCC there. And then you have the small group discussion. And you can see there, there are some of the questions we asked. Why do you think Jesus forgave the men's sins before you physically cured him? Yeah? Do you believe God can cure people today? Have you ever experienced this? So the questions are there for each of us to discuss. And then you have the sending in small groups. That's 10 minutes. And conclusion. And if we need to go a little deeper and take the session a little further, uh, Life Team provides you the link to another session that goes still further into this one. So 
This is primarily what uh, is given to you. In addition to this, we have the skit copy. We have an evaluation form for each of the core team members to evaluate the session at the end of the day so we know exactly how uh, the session has gone for us. So this is primarily our sessions on nut Nutshell. If you'd like to ask some questions, uh, Joe, anything you'd like to add? my friend Pauline after a long time. Um, is there anyone here from um, a, a catechism community that's not English? Uh, no. No, but earlier we had somebody from a Spanish community. Anyway, I'll just tell you a little story. We had a tough retreat. We had a retreat in Rasselkema um, in October and um, there was a community from Dubai called Faith. It was from the Arabic community. So they were reluctant to come because it wasn't English and they weren't too sure. And so I was their small group facilitator. And um, they, were, uh, they, they were very inspiring to me. I mean, we, had, we asked a lot of tough questions and their conversations were very, very mature and very deep. But one thing I noticed is that the teaching and, and the tough retreat was similar to this. There was, a, in the beginning, there was a lot of icebreakers like our gathering, okay? Then there were a series of teachings, either brief testimonies or, um, or skits or musical dramas. And their English was, was good, and they got all the teaching. Then in their small group discussions, it was mostly in Arabic. Well, I was there, so they sort of deferred to me every now and then with some English. But So something like, uh, like this could work with other language groups. Um, the kids in school are most, I mean, the kids generally know enough English. A video like that is a lot of, uh, you know, that would connect with, with almost anybody. And the skits will connect with anybody. Something like a skit, you could easily change into another language. So, I mean, we're still learning and growing, but um, we're finding this very effective with our teenagers in Abu Dhabi. And we're, I think we're going to be offering this to other parishes if they want to try it out and offer training as well. Any questions? Anybody would like to ask? Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it does. And uh, what happens among group discussions, there might be some uh, listeners, there might be uh, not very happy to talk, not very happy to open up yeah. in a larger group. But when it comes to smaller groups, they might somehow open up by talk and the human dynamics might be the language but somehow. It's tremendous. Tremendous. That's really true because that's really what happens in a small group. You find people who are otherwise quite shy and who don't get a chance to participate now become active because they are in a small group of five and six. Any other questions you'd like to ask about the live team program? So uh, I can give you, or oh, me or any of our team can try and uh, answer. Yes? Uh, the subscription is $800 for a year's, uh, for a year's package. Uh, anybody can pick it up, and once you buy the package, as I said, you get the packs that come in according to the semesters, they're posted to you, and you have access to the website. And you can download the material out of the website, uh, whatever you need. So it's available to anyone. Uh, now, there is an issue here, I know that some of the parishes will say, how can we afford to spend $800? But we are in negotiations with Life Dean uh, to give us a vicariate package. So for small parishes, we'll find a way to supply life team uh, to you, uh, you know, and uh, we can work uh, the arrangements. I don't think that is an issue. But if you want to buy it yourself, you certainly can. If you want to look up life team, you can go to their website. A lot of their videos, like the one we showed yesterday, the armor of God is available for download. I, conf I confess is not. It's a new video. So it's only for this, uh, it's come out with this semester. So it's not available for downloads. Uh, 
Ideally, uh, the life, uh, they call them life nights, so they're supposed to be in the evenings, but we can't do that because of various logistic reasons. We hope we can eventually do it. Uh, but ours runs in a normal catechism class. Life team requires one hour Eucharist, one and a half hour for classroom. I know all of you will say we have one hour class. Yeah. yeah. No, the thing is, uh, we are trying to uh, look at Life Teen as a consolidated program because Life Teen takes in everything. It, uh, you'll find that at some stage you find scripture coming in, you find, and over the four years they learn, the program keeps changing. So there's nothing really repeated. So as they go, they experience different teaching over the four years. Yeah. And you can always go back and pull out something from the old stocks. And, and use whenever you want to. Yeah? Okay, that's a good question. Because uh, sometimes you'll find that the session, you may think it's not practical. Yeah, but today, we had guys do the skit without any practice. But they were not speaking. The guys acting out were different and the guys narrating were different just for convenience sake. But we sorted out that problem in five, five minutes. Yeah, so you can do, there are some things that you will find, uh, like you have a water fight, water balloon fight. I mean, we can't think of a water balloon fight in our situation here with uh, maybe uh, 250 kids. So okay, we cut the water balloon fight and, and uh, turn it around a little bit to do something. It's, there are some things that you will have to change and work around. But it's quite easy to implement most of it. Yeah. Uh, I would say, uh, are you teaching catechism already? So you have the qualifications required to teach life team because you're all doing the same thing as a catechist does. Uh, Ariel. Uh, is a catechist like any of, uh, any of you all here. So uh, there's nothing really dramatic required of you. Now what we do is we have pulled our facilitators, small group, and we have trained them with material provided by Life Team. So they know how to facilitate. We don't want a Life Team facilitator to sit here and say, well, I think, you know, uh, wait, uh, just hold on a minute. Let me tell you what I think about confession. It's not going to work really if the facilitator does that. So that's there, yeah? So that. Uh, it's not difficult. You can do it very quickly. A little bit of planning uh, and all the support you need, uh, we can give you anytime. You need us to come and help you with training, getting uh, facilitators together, anything. We are all out to help you. Yeah? You could get it immediately. If you're ready to go in for next uh, semester, uh, you can go in. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, I would, I could do one thing. If anyone wants, yeah. If anyone wants, we could, we could send a session across to you, with the video and everything else, and you could just run one session, and try it out. You know, we'll give you a month's notice. Take a month away somewhere in the middle of Lent and we'll send you a morality lesson right now. So if you can uh, you know, uh, get in touch base with us, we can share that with you. And you can test on the lesson yourself and see how it works. Yeah, Trevor? Yeah. Um, just to, just to um, answer that a little bit more as to how easy it is. Now, as a parish, they've been working with, like I've come out from the same parish. I've finished catechism in the same parish. I left for university, I came back, there was no strong youth ministry. They started youth ministry, they've been working on youth ministry. Horizon was the, the textbook that they used to, the format that they used to follow. And they've been doing it for quite some time. It was already set, it's in place, they come across something like Life Team, okay? They look at it themselves, and in a matter of span, they just switch over to something like Life Team. The focus there is the youth. And it's, it has always been the youth. What we realize by putting in life teen, it's, it's life itself. It connects with them very immediate, okay? I teach confirmation, 
I uh, myself push people, push, I mean, uh, encourage the youth to go and join, okay? And this was before Life Teen started. Uh, they called their friends the minute they were exposed to Life Teen. We had started off when, when, Mr. when, when Joe had started the youth ministry, they were 10 or 15 teens. The main disconnect is once you receive confirmation, that's it, you've graduated, right? Why do I need to come to church? Correct? A lot of the teens, why do I need to be there? I've got other things to do. I can keep myself busy. But this is pulling them in. And I'm not pulling them in. It's them. They've experienced it. They're bringing a friend every week. They have new registrations. And right now, from, from that 10, 15 to 30, we're, we're looking at 100 over the last, say, previous two years, to now... 250 registrations. Am I, and, the, and it's not like we're advertising it all over the place. It's basically his call, and, and the kids are bringing the kids. That's what they're doing. So I think it's really easy. And another thing is, I'm doing, I'm doing confirmation. Uh, they were out of town for, for a week to Oman, to Oman, right? For, for the same uh, format. And uh, it's so easy for people like us who are in constant uh, touch with, the, with, with kids and teens to suddenly fill in a space that I can take a lesson and be as effective as, you know, somebody who's been doing it for years. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. I think that's a great valid point because last uh, week Trevor filled in for us uh, uh, in our session and he's never done a live teen session before this. Yeah, a, a couple of comments. We, as we I mean, Purvis mentioned the possibility of trying out a uh, trying out a session, but I think maybe better than that is um, is studying the program, and I think you have to make a commitment to do training. Um, so, a couple things going on here. We're doing the pilot, and if enough parishes are interested, we've already spoken to Life Teen, the head of Life Teen, about possibly a vicariate wide license. So the bigger pair, I mean, for our, for St. Joseph's, it's not, a, affordability is not an issue. The cost of the subscription averages about 20 dirhams per kid, which is about the same cost as a textbook, and there's no textbook. So it's about the same. For Dubai, it would be even easier, obviously. Um, for small parishes, so we mentioned small parishes, that the cost might be too much for a small parish. And they said, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we think we can do a, maybe a diocesan or vicariate-wide subscription. So and every, every parish maybe will contribute according to the size of their youth program. Secondly, I think for any program to be successful, you need training. Life Teen includes training videos and a whole training manual. Um, and so I think, and, and then because we're piloting it this year, we're picking up experience. The first couple months were a little slow, and, but then by the time we hit the third and fourth month, it really sort of took off and um, we think our teens are, are benefiting in terms of their faith development. Interesting comment on the Life Teen promo video, which is on their um, website. They make the comment that about 10% of American parishes are using Life Teen, but 30% of vocations from the states are coming from parishes with Life Teen. So some, whatever it's doing, it is developing faith. It is, it is drawing kid, teens closer to to their faith and to Jesus in a way that's, that's uh, deep. And, and that's what we're after. It's not about cramming more catechism down their throats. It's about drawing them into a deeper relationship with Christ. Um, so, and then in addition to the Life Teen training, Dayton has a five modules on youth ministry. So if you really want to build youth ministry in your parish, then encourage your youth catechists to take the... Um, the, uh, the youth ministry training on Dayton, they've got, they've got five different ones, a vision for youth ministry, community building, a planning, um, retreat planning. So, so their Life Teen has video training. We're going to pro provide, you know, based on the experience in Abu Dhabi, we're going to be willing to go and train other parishes. And I would encourage parishes to, to have their teens... Um, you know, try a date. You know, go through the Dayton courses on youth ministry and and uh, and the whole catechist formation program that is in place for the vicariate. Um, I think that's most yeah. of it. 
All right, so I think we'll, we'll just close the prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us today to discuss the possibilities of uh, introducing new ways to minister to our teenagers. Lord, if it be your will, uh, let this program of Life Teen reach out to the teenagers in all your parishes in the Vicariate that uh, through these sessions they may draw closer to you, to a conversion and to winning their friends over to you. We make this prayer to you through our a friend and brother, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. If you ever have any questions or anything else, uh, you can reach uh, either Joe or me and we'll be glad to answer. All right? Thank you and God bless you all. Can we sit down? Well, this is something that wasn't on the program. And uh, it happened in Oman. Bishop Paul said he, uh, he was willing to answer questions on the subject that we, uh, the theme of the conference, Eucharist and Liturgy. And so we decided to slot that in uh, today too. Uh, we're not going to take too long. We'll just try. We'll do a, a few questions. Uh, Trevor is around. Uh, We'll come around with the mic. Bishop Paul, we want to come up here. Are you okay sitting down to answer? Good questions. No questions, no answers. No questions. <laughs> Bishop is very happy now. No? Can you, can you come up? If you've got a question, quickly, while the, we fix that cordless mic. Because the people have to hear the question... Otherwise, they don't understand the answer. Okay. <laughs> In the Mass, we are saying, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Then again, Lord, have mercy. Why not Holy Spirit, have mercy?
I could ask you why not Father have mercy. <laughs> because obviously, in, at least in the original form, This is better, huh? As I said, why not Father have mercy? Of course you can address the whole Trinity in this regard, but uh, if we go back to the original Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison, it means not three times the three persons in the Trinity. It, is an an, uh, uh, it addresses the Lord. And it is not first of all a penitential prayer. It is, uh, and uh, no, how can we say it in English, an acclamation of the Lord's greatness and love. That's why we bring it in the liturgy after the confession. It's not the repetition of the penitential act. It is the, the, to recognize the Lord in his mercy, Jesus Christ in his different dim dim dimension. Now, coming back to theologically, of course, you can address the whole Trinity regarding the mercy, but it's not by chance that we always say, through Christ our Lord, he is the one who uh, is the intercessor, the divine intercessor within the Holy Trinity. That's why we address him, and not directly the Holy Spirit, or not even the Father in this moment. Huh? We approach him through the, our Lord Jesus Christ, his son. Don't know if that's sufficient as an answer. Thank you. Um, what's your view on kneeling as we're preparing to receive the Eucharist versus sitting back in the pew? I find that sometimes in Mass, as people sit back, they start talking to each other as we're supposed to be preparing to receive the Eucharist. I just wanted to know, which no, is no, when you're slowly, kneeling, slowly, slowly, you're more yeah, reverent. There are difficulties to understand. You can't yeah. hear me? Can you hear me? No, no, no. okay, yeah. Slowly. Slowly, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, when we're in Mass and we're preparing to receive the Eucharist, um, what is your view on kneeling versus sitting back in the pew? It's been my observation, it's cultural. I, I know in different countries, people do it different ways. I've noticed oftentimes here, when the people sit back, they start talking to each other and they lose interest in preparing to receive the Eucharist versus yeah. when people stay kneeling, they tend to be more reverent. I just wanted to know what your view is and whether you think there should be any consistency or this should be made aware to people. Okay, now I think I understood. Uh, of course, the sitting ha may have to do with the length of the wa waiting to approach the, for the Holy Communion. That's uh, maybe a more uh, practical question, because especially elderly people are happy if they don't need to stand too long or to kneel too long. But coming back, anyway, th there is no reason to get into a chat during the Holy Communion only because you have nothing to do. Uh, you are right, you are right when we are waiting to receive the body of Christ. We have to do something and that means to be in this uh, attitude of reception of the divine guest. That is clear. The rest is a, is a question of the discipline and I would say it, uh, it is the task besides the bishop who is not always in the parishes of the parish priest or of the ushers to look to the people a little bit that they are in a proper way there. <coughs> Kneeling or sitting, for me, that doesn't matter so much if it is done in a proper way. Yeah? Okay. Hi. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I come from Singapore. And in Singapore, recently, after the new change, they have decided that all masses across board in all churches will follow the same music when it comes to the Our Father or the Holy Holy. And it's been standardized. They actually had a very big conference with all music ministries, everybody, to come in and actually standardize. And it was uh, apparently from top down, and it had to be done that way. But I noticed that 
in this MRB actually don't have this uh, standardization. And it seems like uh, every church, uh, every mass uh, is different. I give you gladly an answer. <laughs> <laughs> because the bishop didn't succeed until now to standardize. <laughs> I can tell you, and I have spoken, I don't know how many times to the priests regarding this topic, but you know, we have one basic problem. First of all, even our priests, even our choir directors, they don't know, they don't know anymore to read the notes. They sing with the ear. And then you have all kinds of versions of the same melody, by the way. Or, or the different one. Even yesterday, if you noticed, huh? I sang, uh, let's say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Afterwards, the choir answered in another tonus. <laughs> then I have difficulties to continue and I concentrate. Huh? Peace be with you. And again, there was another melody I can't remember. I, I thought, <laughs> not the right one. Huh? The same for the, the introduction of the preface. Eh? The Lord be with you. Can you hear the salad? <laughs> and when you continue, it's even worse. Eh? Uh, lift up your hearts. Yeah, it's, it's fine, but it's not what is in the book. <laughs> and so on. Eh? So uh, oh, let's take the, the, the doxology at the end of the Eucharistic prayer. And then I, I don't say you have always to take the Amen like is it in the book. The, the simple form, eh? Amen, or something like that. You may have the solemn polyphonic uh, Amen, that's fine. Only afterwards, it's sometimes difficult to pass, because it's another tonus, to, to pass into the, our father singing. Therefore, in many parishes, we sing very seldom, by the way, the our father. And there, again, I have spoken to the priests, I don't know how many times, please use the standard our father, even in singing. And if you have melodies you want to ma maintain, try to adapt it to the, the standard text. Otherwise, we have, again, three or four different forms of the Our Father, and things like that. Now, I can tell you, this fight will continue. Huh? The struggle, uh, we are about to have a liturgical commission and I have already told them that's one of the per, uh, goals to come at least to a, a standard in certain basic melodies. I don't say it has always to be that. You may have in certain occasions, but then it should be clarity. I don't like this, uh, this mix, this Russian salad, where you have all, all kind of... Uh, Nothing against the Russians, but <laughs> and even and even less against the salad, but in the right place uh, and not in the liturgy. Okay, thank you. Uh, when we said the Our Father, uh, we used to see different kind of gestures are used: uh, some join hands together, open hands together, hold hands together. What is mm. the right? Okay, what is the right? You know, in Christians are living in freedom, the freedom of children of God. Now, in the liturgy, of course, it's okay if we have a certain unity in our tenure and attitude. Huh? Uh, for example, when everybody stands, or should stand, then it's nice if everybody stands, except if someone for physical health reasons has to sit, that is clear, then he shouldn't stand. When everybody kneels, it's nice if everybody, when we kneel. Huh? Now to the Our Father. 
Last week, somebody asked me yeah, if the, because they thought this was the standard uh, uh, attitude to pray, yeah? the Our Father. In a certain sense, it may be true, and especially in certain regions of the world, but it's surely not worldwide like that. In my home country, we were educated like that. Not even that. We made it like that. In certain regions, it's like that. Then uh, in Africa, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses and, and so on. Eh? Then uh, here uh, we have some specialists who make like that. Uh, I don't think that they will reach more the heaven than the others. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't want to ridiculize that, but only it, it, sometimes it, it makes the impression as is sometimes would like to get a little bit out of the, the, the crowd. Huh? And I think it's nice. I, it's fine if everybody in a simple way does like that, it's okay. But it shouldn't be a compulsory because this is equally okay or like that. So feel free. Uh, not necessary like that. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, Your Excellency, first, uh, I wanted to congratulate you on your 11th anniversary of the ordination, uh, uh, your ordination, your bishop. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Okay, uh, the question I have, uh, it, it may seem a bit silly, so I'm warning you. Um, so when we receive um, the host, the bread, yes. during the Eucharist, we believe that it is the body, soul, and divinity, body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So when I receive the communion, I know that I've received not just the flesh of Jesus Christ, but also his blood and his mm -hmm. soul and divinity. But in the wine, there is... The blood of Jesus Christ, I understand. Um, so when I, if someone receives both the body and the blood, for example, on a special occasion like a wedding, are they receiving any more than the rest of us who receive just the bread? <laughs> okay. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have in me the text of the wonderful hymn of uh, Thomas Aquinas. But I would say if you receive a big host or a small one, you don't me, uh, get more or less body of the Christ. And I would say even uh, regarding the blood. Now, that is, of course, the question of the teaching of the church, uh, that in both, you receive both. Even in the chalice, you are receiving somehow the body of Christ, the whole Christ. But the sacramental form and expression is different. And in the Catholic Church, in the Roman Catholic Church, usually we had only under one species. But, for example, someone who can't support the host, you could equally simply give the chalice. He would or she would receive fully the Holy Communion. Looking liturgically, of course, the ideal would be if we could give always both or the both spaces. And those who have studied a little bit the church history, they know it was a big issue at the beginning of the Protestant reform. And they were asking also that the chalice would be given to the faithful. And that was re refused because it was somehow thought it would not be fully orthodox. Although in the old church it was uh, ab absolutely clear that people would uh, take the communion under both species. And you know, nowadays, first of all in the oriental churches, still it's the case. When you go to, uh, unless you have too many people, sometimes it's a practical question, but if you go to a Siro Malankara Mass here, or to the Siro Malaba Mass in certain uh, parishes where there are not too many people, then they will receive per, per intinction 
Also the Maronites do the same. In the Arabic masses, in some at least, I have seen they do that automatically. There is not a problem. In the Catholic Church, since the Council, in the Roman Catholic Church, we do it in certain occasions. First communion in certain places they do it. Confirmation, if the number is not too big. You know, sometimes, even for the bishop, in, in Dubai, after having imposed and, uh, and um, anointed 400 plus children and then going back and to distribute the Holy Communion in two species, I am, I am exhausted. <laughs> Especially when two services are on the same day, what happens? Huh? So sometimes they are simply limited also by that. Of course I have <laughs> assistance, but even then it's not so easy because you know, on the confirmation, everybody wants to go to the bishop because more important than the sacrament for many is the photo afterwards. Huh? <laughs> That's another issue we could, we could have a discussion about. The photographs during the liturgy. You can, but nothing against the man here, huh? <laughs> <laughs> because we, we, can, we are not in the liturgy now. But sometimes I'm really upset. Why do we need a photo from taking the Holy Communion? It's such a moment of intimacy that we shouldn't do that normally. Excuse me if I'm uh, bringing an example. Who of us, if you, has ordered the photograph for the wedding night? Yeah. <laughs> although, 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 according to the teaching of the Catholic Church, the consumption of the, uh, the wedding is the, done then, and that makes it absolute indissoluble. And uh, as long as you have only the consensus, there would still be a slight possibility to get back. But once you have consumed the marriage, and, uh, so that means <laughs> that the sacrament is fully constituted in, fully in its integrity in that moment. And there are moments we should, by simply reverence, not make photos. And uh, sometimes I have the same feeling in the liturgy. I feel exposed. Where it's done in the right way. In uh, Abu Dhabi, I think they have found the solution years ago. I don't know if it continues. For the first communion, <laughs> it, it's also not necessarily the best, but they made a, a kind of rehearsal with a, not with a real host, but for the photograph. Huh? outside of the liturgy. Then you have a picture, you have a picture for the album, that's fine. Nobody knows afterwards that it was not the real, the, the real first communion. And then the, the real first communion is free from this pressure and uh, all these photographers are running around and so on. Uh, by the way, if we are speaking about that, huh, it's not only a question of photographs. Be careful with the additional items. Example, candles, with the burn, burning candles. Very dangerous sometimes, especially if the people have uh, a veil. I have sometimes distributing, they, they hold it like that, nervous. <laughs> huh? And you have to give the Holy Communion, I have to be f careful that I don't <laughs> burn the chasuble. Who in this moment is really open for what is the most important. So sometimes less is more. Uh, you, you know, uh, those who follow a little bit my liturgy, I am always for this simplicity. If we can do it, okay, okay. But uh, sometimes it's very tricky. And then not only that, they hang, I don't know what, uh, around the hands and so on. No, make it simple. Okay. Thank you, my lord. 
In the um, liturgy, we are exposed to the Eucharistic prayer, and there are several. Yeah. There are four main Eucharistic prayer. Why are we exposed only to the second? <laughs> is it because of time? Because there are, the, especially the fourth that is so rich mm -hmm. about the, myst the Paschal mystery, we are never exposed to it. Thank you. I agree with you, but I think the main reason is actually in our, you know, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi, one mass after the other, where we have always to be careful that we have sufficient time between. Uh, that surely is one of the main reasons. Weekday mass in the morning, I have it, uh, usually when I'm back home in, in the cathedral, I have the morning mass at half past six. People, they said, we, it has to be finished at five to seven because otherwise we don't reach uh, certain hospitals and so on. Uh, so sometimes I say, okay, we do what we can. Then I look when I'm preparing uh, the length of the readings because that influences also. And then according to that, I make the choice. And then I'm going to the sacristy. I take sometimes, the third anyway, that I take from time to time. The fourth, I admit, very seldom because that's remarkably longer, also the first of God. But for example, this for special needs, I, with a certain regularity, I take. Looking before, when I am preparing the liturgy, uh, of course, when you have the whole story of the Susanna, which uh, lasts for, uh, f uh, for 15 minutes uh, when you are reading it, then I cannot take equally a long uh, Eucharistic prayer. It's a pastoral question in that moment. Huh? But I agree with you, we should vary, uh, vary a little bit more than we do. It, it, it's a beautiful, the second one, but it has become almost uh, in certain parishes the standard, only that, and that's not correct. There, too, we have spoken about uh, during the priest meeting in the past, and they continue to do it with uh, mediocre success, as in many other fields. Huh? Thank you. Your Excellency, this is uh, from St. Michael's Church, Sharjah. Uh, we are, I think now, among all the churches in this uh, UAE diocese, we are the smallest church with a big number of catechism children. We have more than 4,000 children on the roll. And we have a great constraint for space in church as well as in the classrooms. We need your help. <laughs> <laughs> I will help you. Thank you. <laughs> if you knew the, the steps already are taken until now, and I've spoken to the Crown Prince, spoken to the Emir, spoken through other offices. Uh, the last letter is how many months? Two, two months or something like that regarding this issue. It, I can't tell you. I repeat what I told so many times. When I came to the Gulf, I had to learn patience. Yeah. And if you don't learn patience here, you are forced to do it, uh, or you go back home. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. There's no other way. You know, let's take the, the construction of the church in Doha. From the first moment when it was a serious dealing with the emir or with the ministry, it took 15 years to the consecration of the church. Here, hopefully, it will not last and, uh, so, so much, but uh, my, my time also <laughs> is limited. But I can tell you, regarding Charge, I have tried, and we continue to try. I asked in Ajman, I asked, that, that would already help if we could have something in Ajman, then a part of Charge would be a little bit le less under stress. I tried in Umar Kuen, there we have something, probably, where we have, now, again, to change the location uh, because uh, we cannot uh, renew the, the rent and so on. There are a lot of these this, uh, obstacles. I was now lucky 
in Abu Dhabi because there, when I saw there was a certain possibility, I caught the occasion. And fortunately, I succeeded, first of all, that we got the permission in St. Joseph's itself to extend, expand, and now the church in uh, Musafa. So in Duba Abu Dhabi is lucky because uh, so through certain channels, uh, I got this chance because I know also b better certain people. In Dubai, here, uh, um, in uh, St. Mary's, we have a similar situation, by the way. You have seen the figures this morning. How many times have I written letters through this way, through the other way, to get uh, land permission for a second church? Not yet. I hope it will be done one day. Sharsha, I fully agree there's not only the space, but there's a parking problem, and uh, obviously uh, we should have more space. Huh? <coughs> pray, pray, uh, if you... Any, uh, um, I, I'd like to ask about the collection we have at Mass. Last year in our parish here in Jebel Ali, the collection, the timing of the collection was changed from the beginning of the offertory to prayers of the faithful. And as a parishioner, and also as somebody who's trying to help to educate the confirmation class, mm -hmm. I find that it's extremely disruptive. The prayers of the faithful are not even being listened to. Um, and I'm just wondering why has that change come, a, come across? You know, why has it been changed? And do we have to live with this change? Yeah. Because I, I, I don't know if it's very productive. Thank you for this question because I was upset yesterday during the Oh, thank God. <laughs> not to say shocked. No, no. When intercessions, then intercessions. Uh, there was even the proposal in some places that we should wait with the, offer, uh, with the offertory prayer until the collection is over. Now maybe for also for practical reasons uh, we, uh, we can't do that. But the intercessions are not... Uh, we do not start with uh, the collection during the intercession. That's its own, uh, uh, its own liturgical act. The offertories are given as a sharing, an expression of the faithful to give and to share it with the poor, respectively with the, with the needs of the church. So I fully agree with you. So, uh, so. I don't you, know who has introduced that, yeah. and I am in a delicate situation because I don't want to blame anybody okay. who has done for one reason or the yeah. other. They are very often <laughs> have to be careful because otherwise the, 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 the people say uh, he has spoken against the parish priest, so I don't know yeah. against whom, and that I do not want. But I will, when I saw that yesterday, I thought, this has to be on the agenda of one yeah, of the can next we, meetings. Can we, yeah, can it be looked at? Because if it means expend, extending the Mass by another two or three minutes, let's finish Prayers of the Faithful, do the collection before we move on to the next, if, if we need to. Now you allow me a side remark and to shorten the announcements. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll we take one more question. Bishop, this is regarding the homily given by the priests. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, I know all the priests have good knowledge, uh, but when they break the word, some are very good, and we can understand and take home something. S some priests like... <laughs> yeah, I know what you want to say. <laughs> Uh, listen, here in our midst is an old priest who speaks very well, Father Michael Egan, and he always says our priests, especially, they should have more education in allocation, huh? uh, to how to speak, and I fully agree with that. 
Now, of course, in our multicultural context, we have people from all over the world, and very few of us are native speaking English. Me too, I have difficulties. You cannot imagine the efforts I had to do at the beginning when I was within one month catapulted from the Italian and French speaking world to the English speaking world here. It was really a hard work and <laughs> sweating. Uh, but I always tried, I know that I'm not perfect neither in English nor in other domains, uh, but I tried to speak first of all, relatively slowly, and to pronounce more or less correct that people, in a distinct way that people can understand. One of the problems we have actually is that according to the language, back, the mother tongue language background, some of our priests simply pronounce in a way that many people can't understand. I had more than one faithful during my pastoral visit who told me I don't go to church anymore or only occasionally because I don't understand. And that is a topic which I bring up regularly also during our meetings. Even a short time ago, I said, look, don't, don't be too proud to take a training. Why not to ask from time to time the faithful? It's not, we, we shouldn't be ashamed. Or make yourself an exercise. Record your homily. Uh, either uh, or audio or even a video. Just to have a certain self-control. Because I'm sure many of our priests, they think uh, yeah, I am okay, and they are not aware. Besides the problem of this, because the use of the micro, that's uh, an art, uh, a special art, even for the readers, but uh, normally they are rather well trained, so uh, what I can see. But coming back now to the content of the homily, that's another issue. There are people who are very strong in <coughs> storytellers. Huh? Now, a story, I don't have that gift, unfortunately. But if someone masters that gift and can truly, through the story, tell the story of the gospel, that's fine. But uh, a, a homily shouldn't be an entertainment. It shouldn't be simply a, mo a moralistic admonition of the people. It shouldn't be a moment where I can uh, address practical questions in the parish uh, to ad because uh, normally people cannot react. Huh? If, and then we have to be very careful that we are always respecting the dignity of the faithful. As you said, a homily is there to share the break, the word of God, to explain it, or it may be as a topic from the from, from the liturgy, the, what we did these days, these two days, that can well be also the content uh, or object of a, of a homily, the well done, f uh, um, a prayer of the Holy Eucharist, a psalm, and so on. Do that, yes, uh, I agree. Then, of course, uh, to understand that Maybe uh, me, me too, the bishop sometimes may be a little bit too high for the normal understanding of the people. I, I try to be as simple as possible. Uh, we do not always ac succeed. And I don't blame the priest, except if I have the feeling they do not make a special effort. And that's a question of the preparation also. You have to prepare a homily. You cannot simply in the sacristy have a look into the book and then say a few, a few words to the text. That doesn't work. You have to meditate it, you have to pray over it, you have to study a little bit the background, not only a little bit, but at least that, and then prepare it and to ask you what you want to tell the people as a message which is not coming from me, which is coming from the book from the from the message uh, from the gospel yeah this would be also evening feeling huh? 
uh, a topic because there are so many questions related to that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Bishop Paul. Uh, if you could just wait for a few minutes. Uh, while Bishop Paul is here, we'd like to acknowledge uh, some successes in our catechism program. Uh, can I call on Kate and uh, Zelma? Okay, we're going we're gonna to distribute the Master Catechist certificates, and they'll be presented by Bishop Paul. As you know, the Master Catechist is the highest designation of uh, catechetical formation, and it means they have, they have done over 200 hours of formation in two years. So, and we have quite a few, okay. Leslie Paul DaCosta. Frida DeMello. Okay. Celine Mathias. Susan De Silva. <clears throat> John DeMello. <coughs> Anita Mendes. <laughs> Faustine Alva. Daniel Fernandez. Faustine, are you here? Okay, we'll hold on to that and we'll give it to Rocky. Um, or Sister Elizabeth, if she's still here. Daniel Fernandez. And Dorothy Fernandez, together. <laughs> Two master catechists in one family. Very good. Venita Fernandez. Are they related? Are they related? I wonder. Yeah. Venita Fernandez? No? Okay. Cecilia Ratnayaki. No? Cecilia? Cecilia Renuka Ratnayaki. No? No? Okay. Sharon Fernandez. Mm. Sylvia Bataler. Sharon De Lima. Mary Magdalene Lobo. Amini Jacob. Garen Elizabeth Dias. Felicima Poblati. Diodita Vaz. Dominic Lobo. Let's do the one camera. Annabelle Williams. <laughs> Daphne Suarez. <laughs> Doreen Pereira. Oliver Gomes, Abu Dhabi. <laughs> and Purvis D'Souza. Master, master. Okay. 
All right, and we'll... Uh, Uh, we'll just like to do a few thank yous and uh, can I call uh, Jyoti? Put your hands together for one of the ladies behind the scenes. Good evening, everybody. I can do something you cannot do. You can do something I cannot do. But together, we can do something great. So said Mother Teresa. And that's how this conference works. In a spirit of collaboration, cooperation, and support. While there are many to thank uh, from the teams you saw in the front line, as you see them, um, and to those anonymous people who manage the projectors and the logistics for you, um, I'd like to extend a special thanks to all the parishes who came together to make this conference happen. Um, for all those calls during office times and during evening times and during midnight times when I've asked for a hand in terms of lending of projectors, lending of volunteers, people turning up at 7.30 on Friday morning, thank you. Muchos gracias. A big thank you to the Abu Dhabi Office of uh, Christian Formation for choosing St. Francis of Jabalali to host the conference and to have us here as the venue of choice. Um, I deeply appreciate um, Bishop Paul Hinder's presence here today and yesterday. And while I volunteer for very many masses to help and support, um, it was uh, a very touching moment for me and my volunteers yesterday because we actually stood and attended the mass uh, between yesterday and today. Um, it was a magical reflection of what heaven must look like um, for a Sunday morning mass. Uh, the bishop's mass yesterday and the mass uh, that happened this morning. Um, I was speaking to Don Fox and I said, it looks like a, a mini UN at the altar because we had a representation uh, from every community, or country, um, race, and species, and we were all together saying the same mass together. Hey, yeah? So, thank you. And um, thank you for making us catechists feel special with those masses. Yeah, bravo. Thank you, Jyoti. Well, Kate would like to do a few thank yous. Uh, you know, it's, it's that time when we really have to say thank you. Uh, before I do that, I just, I found out yesterday that we have a really special uh, couple, a family who are leaving the UAE after, I think, over 15 years of being here and in those years being involved in, in catechetical work. Xavier and Eugenio, will you please stand up? Where are you? Bishop Paul, would you just give them a blessing, please? Thank you. Thank you both for all your hard work. 15 years. And we'd just like to thank all the people. First of all, the parish team in Jabal Ali is just really amazing. Um, uh, Jyoti that you just heard, Diana, Christina, Joe, the whole gang, you're just absolutely wonderful. The young people the youth that helped out, especially yesterday with the Mass. Shout out to you in the back. Thank you very much. Please come up. We have some chocolates for you. Vikas, Chuka, and Roshan, the guys that uh, did the AV stuff, thank you so much. You've been there the whole time. I don't know. Yes, two boxes. Yeah. 
Yes. Um, could um, some representatives of the Jabalali team come up and receive the chocolates? And you have to share. Joe Darnell, Jyoti, Diana, come on. Some youth, come on up here. Thank you so much. They're very patient, very helpful. Because really, we started working on this conference last year. So. Um, I'm looking for, looking for Father Michael Egan. Are you out there, Father Michael? Yes, come. Where are you? Yes, the man. Oh, well, we want to thank you to Father Michael. I've got something for him as well for welcoming us and being our point of contact while Father Eugene is away. Look at all these nice young people. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And just stay up here. Just stay up here. We'll close out the conference together, okay? Okay, and I want to, spell, I want to thank in a special way I want to thank Rocky Patel from Sharjah because he did an incredible amount of logistic work with me for hotels, for transport, for air, airport pickups. Rocky, you come up here, please. Where are you? One small box. Okay, make sure I'm not forgetting anybody. Now I'm going to call up the speakers who have, have shared their wisdom with us. And um, I've learned an awful lot this weekend, and I'm sure you have too. Rocky, thank you for everything. Also, this is for Rocky's wife, Sharon, who helped with all the hotel arrangements. Rocky, where are you going? Get back up here. Okay, now our speakers. Sister Elizabeth. Dr. Carol Ipers. Father Ron Lewinsky. Father Paul Karam. John Turner. Melissa had to leave to do some work. Mari Cook. Sister Letitia. Pauline Oburu. Mary Ella. Father Arul. Callistus. Merwin Petreo. The folks from Lighthouse Catholic Media, Maurice, Caroline, and Michael. Zelma and Purvis to Sousa. And then I'd like to ask two of our special guests. In Ethiopia, we, instead of saying Father, we say Abba. So Abba Petros, Abba Gurme, please come up. And Joe Flynn, oh, <laughs> Joseph Flynn, there he is, okay. <laughs> We're really glad to have you with us. Um, some of you know that um, I've, been, I've been talking for about two years now about sharing some of what we have with other communities. And because I have a daughter in Ethiopia, Ethiopia has been a natural fit. And also, anyone that's been there, um, it's, a, it's an incredible place. And so we're going to be working with um, the catechist in Ethiopia, and, and Bishop Paul has given us permission for us to do this, because we have a lot of good catechists here that can go and, and help out in formation. Yeah. So um, uh, the last time I was in Ethiopia... I, I went, the vestments in Ethiopia are so beautiful. My goodness, the tapestries, anyone that's seen these are just beautiful. So actually, I went with Sister Letitia um, to look at some cloth for vestments. And we were going to have one made, and we talked to a tailor, but Sister Letitia wasn't happy with that tailor. So she stitched something herself. And Bishop Paul, this is from us to say thank you for all that you do. Who's got it? Who's got the, there we go. Can you give it to Sister Letitia, please? That's okay. <laughs> wow.
And Abba Petros and Abba Germe have something for you as well from Ethiopia. Yes, you may. Good evening, all of you. Um, congratulations uh, for uh, the edifying work. Uh, congratulations for the Apostolic Vicariate Vicar of uh, Southern Arabia. Uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, grateful to be part of this program. And uh, oh, okay. So um, we are very happy that we are here with you. Uh, despite you know the problems here in this region, uh, you uh, are a very vibrant uh, church community. And we would like also uh, to thank you for uh, uh, having us here uh, to be part of this program. And we would like to give uh, to His Excellency the Bishop uh, uh, because uh, we are here uh, in, with the permission of uh, the Bishop. Um, and we would like to give uh, as a token of our gratitude an Ethiopian cross. Um, I, I would like to show you, um, it's a wooden cross. Ethiopia have uh, 365 types of uh, crosses and hundreds of uh, monasteries uh, throughout the centuries developed uh, various uh, religious traditions and also corresponding uh, traditional objects. So this is one of the 365 types of crosses and I would like to uh, give it or apagrima uh, on behalf of the uh, participants from Ethiopia. We would like to give him to uh, His Excellency uh, Bishop Paul. <laughs> and we have another one for uh, uh, the Office of Christian Formation. Uh, this is uh, a Lalibela cross. In Lalibela is in the northern part of Ethiopia. You have uh, 11 uh, um, from stone hewn churches. The churches are built in the 11th century because of the Mo Muslim invasion uh, and, and other uh, uh, um, to, to protect the churches. The king Lalibela um, advised to build the churches uh, underground. So the La Libra crosses here for the Christian Formation Office. <laughs> and another one for uh, Kate and uh, Joe, who invited us and who have been in Ethiopia. <laughs> And I would like also to invite uh, His Excellency Bishop Paul to Ethiopia for three reasons. One uh, is uh, that is uh, to celebrate our communion, uh, universal, in the universality of the church. And the second reason is he's a good speaker, so he can inspire us to, to do our evangelization work in Ethiopia. And the third reason is uh, in Ethiopia, you may know, we are now celebrating uh, the year 2007. So if he comes to Ethiopia, it is beneficial for you because he will be seven years younger. <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's very interesting. Now, Bishop, one last before you go, or one last thank you. Yeah, I just want to, for my part, I have somebody really special I'd like to thank, and that is our secretary, Winnie. Where are you, Winnie? She's hard to miss. Where is she? There she comes. It's been a steep learning curve in the last few months. I told her what this would be like, and it was just as difficult, yeah? Thank you so much, Winnie. The, uh, no, wait a moment, wait a moment. <laughs> it, it will come, it will come. But I would like to finish the word of thanks. Of course, 
uh, Kate could not thank herself. <laughs> so uh, I do it on behalf of you all. Thank you, Kate, for the wonderful work you've done. But especially I would like to thank you all here still present and those who had already gone or who could not attend this meeting for other reasons. Uh, as I said very often in occasions of my pastoral visit, you are my co-workers. And without you, what could we do? So I am very grateful for your dedicated work I am well aware it's not always easy. It may also be that everybody is always at the same height, but it's wonderful to see with what a commitment you are doing the work every week during the school year and uh, to teach our children, to help them to grow in their faith and to bring over something, not only to the world, but hopefully also through your personal witness because that is uh, language that speaks more than many words when the children see these people are truly s themselves believers in our Lord Jesus Christ and uh, in uh, what he did for us to save us. So thank you again to you all and I can only hope that we can continue to work together and to improve what has to be improved. It's true for the bishop, it's true for the priest, it's true for all of us that we are on the way and that is very important. And now you can stand up for the blessing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, give me the cross. The Lord be with you. And, with your and may Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay, wait. We'll have the flags brought out. Yeah? Purvis? Wait one second. You guys can go sit down and we'll Purvis, everybody's leaving. You won't do the flags, yeah. Can we just hold on a minute and do the recession of the flags and if you want to see your photographs going up. Don't move guys, just wait a minute. You can stand up and just watch up here. Just stand up and watch there. If you watch the screen you can see your photographs out there. And we'll have the flags recessing out. Traditionally, it'll mark the close of the conference. One cup of blessing which we bless. And we so many. And can I uh, call the Dayton coordinators to please meet Selma? Or two, servant or free, woman or man, the more one red, one body.
rain for the fields scattered and grown one to one for all one breath One cup of blood